It is our customary procedure to spend the next few moments in silent prayer, giving each of you the privacy of your priesthood to rebound if necessary. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, let us pray. Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege and opportunity to assemble ourselves together for the purpose of learning the Word of God. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us concerning the things we note. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen. Turn your Bibles to Galatians 1.5. Galatians 1.5. We're getting close to the end of the salutation. To whom Jesus Christ be glory forever and ever, I believe it. We left off with the word amen, I believe it. What does amen mean? Many people are very confused about its meaning. Many people attach superstition to it. They attach a ritual to it. Many people shout it during sermons if they get excited. But amen actually has meaning and deep meaning. Every word in the Bible has meaning. It's just not something for us to use ritually without reality. So amen, A-M-E-N, has been transliterated from three languages, and it has retained its purity in these three languages, Hebrew, Greek, and English. They say it the same in all languages, amen, amen. Uh, maybe a bit different accent, but amen, amen, however you say it, it's Hebrew, Greek, and English. Amen refers to the acclamation of doctrine in Christian worship. Amen refers to the acclamation of doctrine in Christian worship. It means you believe it. Amen again means I believe it. It means you're accumulating doctrine. Why? Because you believe it. Amen is actually referring to Operation Z. This is amen, believe it or not. Being filled with the Spirit, you learn the Word of God. Pastor, teacher teaches you the Word. Holy Spirit uh, makes it understandable. Your human spirit takes it and transfers it by faith, or actually it automatically transfers it to gnosis, which means academic knowledge. Now you have academic knowledge. Now you have the amen. And what is amen? You know it, you understand it, God the Holy Spirit's taught it to you along with the pastor, then you amen it, believe it. You say, I believe it, gnosis then transfers to epinosis. That's what amen means in the Bible, transference of gnosis to epinosis doctrine. Amen refers to the second half of Operation Z. So it does have a technical meaning not just something people what well, people do just shout it out but I think oftentimes people shout out amen they don't even know what they're saying just something to do if you were saying somebody shouting amen well that's fine what do you what what are you saying they wouldn't even be able to answer you, you know, I just feel good and want to say it what well, has meaning amen is often said at the termination of a doxology or a prayer and why? Because you've said the prayer and you, at the end of the prayer, say, in Christ's name, amen. In Christ's name, I believe it. It's application of the faith rest drill. Whatsoever you ask in prayer, believing, you shall receive. So you say, amen, I believe it, indicating you believe it. And by the way, if you go into prayer and you fall asleep and never get to say amen, but you're in fellowship, your prayer is still heard. Just because you never get to amen doesn't mean anything. It might mean you're sleepy and that's about it. So you can pray for an hour before you go to sleep and fall asleep on your knees even. You see, there's nothing, the position that you pray in really means nothing either. If I'm a little sleepy, I might get on my knees to keep me awake. If you lay down and start praying, it might last 15 minutes or 5 minutes and off to sleep you go. In fact, praying is a good way to go to sleep. Just pray, 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 and then go to sleep. You never get to amen. That's fine. Because amen simply means faith. You believe it. So it should be translated, I believe it. 
and this has to do with gnosis being converted into epinosis, Operation Z. The cold goal of learning Bible doctrine is to amen it, believe it. And uh, when I go over some things, for example, when I went over uh, Galatians 1.1, 1, 1, not everybody had to say amen, I believe it. That's your choice. You can believe it or reject it. And when people say amen, just to say it, it's usually just to bring attention to themselves. So amen is actually what you say in your soul. You say it in your soul, I believe it. And you don't even say it to yourself, you just believe it. It's something that occurs in the soul. You amen doctrine in the soul, meaning you believe it. Amen at the end of a prayer means you've approached the throne of grace as a believer priest, the high priest, our Lord Jesus Christ. So amen at the end of a prayer means you've related it, the prayer to the content of the faith rest drill. Again, whatever you ask in prayer, believing, you will receive. So amen is an acknowledgement that you're believing it and using the faith rest drill in your prayer life. Mark 11:24. Therefore I say to you, all things for which you pray and ask, believe that you shall receive them and they shall be yours. You've got to believe it. You've got to amen it as a part of a function of prayer. Now we have a single amen before a phrase. And Jesus said, Amen. I say to you, Amen lego humane. Jesus said, Amen lego humane. And this means, believe the truth I am communicating to you. And our Lord told that to the disciples. Believe, Amen, lego, the truth, humane, that I give to you. Amen, lego, humane, believe the truth I give to you. So that's a single amen, to believe it. Then we have double amen. And if you've been around some traditional churches, they might say amen and amen. It has meaning. And the doubling of the word amen, as our Lord often used it, our Lord would say amen and amen. I watched uh, the 50th anniversary the other day, and one of the pastors that got up at the end of the, his prayer said amen and amen. And it has meaning. And what it means is, I believe a specific point of doctrine. You say amen, you believe something in general. You say amen and amen, you're believing a specific point of doctrine. For example, if I were teaching freedom through military victory, and I said we need to blow the hell out of the Middle East, you might say amen and amen. I believe that specific point of doctrine, and it is a point of doctrine. Amen and amen. So we have the usage of amen. And we'll get some points on the usage of amen. Amen is used to co confirm or affirm a statement. Amen, amen, is used to uh, confirm or affirm, affirm a statement. Point two. Amen is used to communicate doctrine in general or a specific point of doctrine. Amen is used to communicate doctrine in general or a specific point of doctrine. Point three. Amen is used for faith or faithfulness. Amen is used for faith, I believe it, or faithfulness. You amen doctrine, you believe it. You amen doctrine, you're faithful in learning it. Point four, amen is used in prayer to express the faith rest drill regarding petition and intercession. Amen is used in prayer to express the faith rest drill regarding both petition and intercession for others. Point five. Amen expresses faith perception, converting gnosis into epinosis, believing academic knowledge, converting it into beyond knowledge, epinosis. Amen actually expresses the process of metabolizing the Word of God in your soul. Amen expresses faith perception, converting gnosis into epinosis, 
the process of metabolizing doctrine. But point six. Amen is used in liturgy in faith response to doctrine. Liturgy, again, a, a pastor will get up and uh, through a ritual, and, and sometimes this is very legitimate, through liturgy, the a pastor will call on a congregational response, meaning the congregation will chant or speak in unison, Amen. Liturgy. It may call for a congregational response, meaning the congregation chants or speaks in unison, Amen. Usually they will do this at the end of the prayer. Nothing wrong with it. If I finish a prayer and say Amen, and all of you say Amen, nothing wrong with it, you're all saying it in liturgy. You're all saying it in unison, which means it's not bringing attention directly to yourself. So it is used in that way. This is what amen is not for. Point seven. It's not for this. It's that nowhere in the Bible do they use amen in such ways. Amen is not used to interrupt a sermon. And that's actually what it does when people individually shout amen. It's distracting. It's distracting to me, especially, and it's distracting to others who may be sitting beside you trying to get a point of doctrine. And while they're trying to get a point of doctrine, you shout amen right beside them. And then what they hear is me speaking and then a shout of amen, and it breaks concentration. And in a service, concentration is very important. So amen is not used to interrupt a sermon. All this means you have poor manners. You indicate that you have a lack of concentration. Oftentimes people shout amen because they're not even really concentrating. They interrupt their concentration if they were concentrating by shouting amen. It's just as if you just stood up in church. Breaks concentration and, inter and interrupts the sermon. So it's poor manners. Indicates lack of concentration or broken concentration. It is rude. Now I know in the tradition of things, the way people are in, uh, traditionally, amen this, amen that, amen the other thing, and they consider that a part of worship. Remember one time I had a friend over and my pastor was talking about amen and he said, it is, and you know how he is, it is rude when somebody says amen while I'm trying to teach the word. And that guy was so terrified he ran out the door. He wasn't going to listen to that anymore. He said, amen's a part of worship. It's something you do in your soul. Shouting amen all day does not impress God one bit. It might impress others. You see, some people say amen, so they look spiritual. They look heavenward. Amen, brother, preach it. They say, oh, isn't he spiritual? And a lot of times preachers like it because they don't know what they're saying either. So if they get, if they get some feedback, well, it just charges their ego. Yeah, I'm really firing them up now. They're shouting amen. All right. But that is not what it was ever meant to be used for. It, arrogant individuals shout amen when they agree to points of a message. Now, people have come in here who don't know any better and have said it, and I'm not going to chew them out. They don't know any better. They were raised differently, and I understand that. But if all of you just started shouting amen suddenly, I would think you'd lost your mind, and you would have. So it's out of line. It's not necessary. It's not a point of worship to run around shouting amen or just to sit there and shout it. You amen in your soul. And whether you believe it or not is between you and God. And some people might really get fired up about something and say amen because they believe it and they truly believe it. But that's between you and God and I don't need to know about it. Or you might say no amen or not amen. I don't believe it. If people were really using it correctly, most people, when they were listening to a point of doctrine, would say, not amen, I do not believe it. So amen is also used in Ephesians 3.21 for metabolization of doctrine. And again, it's tantamount to converting gnosis into epinosis. So that's amen, and that's Paul's use of it in 1.5. Now let's look at Galatians 1.6. Galatians 1.6. Now, some of the things we will go over in Galatians will be review, but it's good to review. Galatians is a somewhat basic book in that it simply destroys legalism, rips it apart. 
and I've done that so much that a lot of this, some of it will be repetition, some of it will not be. So one six. I am astonished. Now this is present linear action, sir. That means the Apostle Paul keeps on being astonished at the defection of believers. He keeps on being in a state of shock. I am astonished, shocked, keep on being shocked, that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you. What is happening is the Apostle Paul has given them very clearly it's faith alone in Christ alone. And when Paul first came to Galatia, they thought he was a god. Then they thought he was an angel. And then finally they just said, well, you're a great apostle and a great Bible teacher. I believe in Christ. They finally got straightened out, and they did believe in Christ. And uh, Paul stayed with them a while. But as soon as Paul left, here come the Judaizers. Here come the legalists. And he was shocked that they so quickly deserted the one who called you. He was totally shocked that they went so quickly for legalism. And people will. If you reject this ministry, you will go so fast into legalism, it would not shock me because I know these things, but maybe it would. It, would, it might shock yourself how fast, if you neglect doctrine, how fast you'll go right back into legalism. If you neglect or reject doctrine, you will be back into legalism and it happens with anybody and it would happen in a very, very short time. Go back to your old traditions, your old ways. So it shocked Paul. He had been gone for a while and now they've gone into legalism. So that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you is referring to election. That is through election. You've been called that is talking about the doctrine of reconciliation and election. Now I want you to notice something. You are quickly deserting the one who called you. You were called by Christ. You don't invite him. He invites you. And that's all throughout Scripture. And so uh, Apostle Paul would say today, I am shocked. I am astonished that so many of you are inviting Christ somewhere when he called you. Jesus Christ called you. We don't call him. We don't invite him. We're spiritually dead. Dead people can't call up somebody and invite them. They're dead. Spiritually dead. And we've noted that enough. But maybe not enough because people would... Uh, you'd go right back into that if you neglected or rejected doctrine. You would be telling people to invite Christ into their heart even though you've heard it even though you've seen it's not in the Bible even though you've seen passages that tell you how to be saved if you neglect or reject the word you'll do just like the Galatians and just as quickly we're no different than the Galatians that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you into the grace of Christ and following a different gospel principles out of that again you may have been with me all this time and you might uh, suddenly uh, understand that you're saved by faith alone in Christ alone, but as soon as you reject doctrine or neglect it, you will go just like the Galatians and go AWOL from grace and go right into legalism. And uh, you might have all types of reasons. i got to go here, there's more people. And then you go there for that reason and then suddenly you're led astray once again into slavery called legalism the slavery of legalism. My children need to go here to have social life. You will be sucked right into legalism, just like the Galatians. You don't hang around those people. The Bible tells you with whom to hang around. I'm not, but the Bible does. And if you hang around legalists, you hang around idiots who say your children should invite Christ into their heart, well, you are failing as a parent for one thing, and for another thing, you will go in that direction. You'll follow them because you can't change evil, but evil can surely change you. Get away from that junk. If you don't, you will go AWOL like the Galatians. That's the first point. Second point, these Galatians have heard the truth. These Galatians have believed in Christ. They've heard Paul. They've heard Paul say specifically, faith alone in Christ alone. 
They've heard Paul say, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. They've heard Paul say, it's by grace you have been saved through faith and that not of yourselves is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. They've heard Paul say, it's not by works. They've heard Paul say, you don't have to be circumcised and follow the Mosaic law. They've heard these things over and over and over again. Paul repeated a lot. And as soon as Paul left, they went AWOL quickly. They quickly went AWOL because evil people, they associated themselves with evil people and they turned toward legalism and by the time we get through with Galatians, you should understand how much God despises legalism because Paul is simply reflecting the attitude of God. Right now, he's still being soft right now, but it's going to get tougher and tougher. One thing we must also note is the fact they went AWOL from grace. Point three, they went AWOL from grace. The Galatians have. But even though they went AWOL from grace, grace hasn't gone AWOL from them. So regardless of the fact that the Galatians have gone AWOL from grace, they're still under God's grace. They're still saved. They're going through the pain of circumcision. circumcision all the men are. And here are grown men cutting off their foreskin, going through extraordinary pain and thinking they're spiritual doing it. But regardless of the fact they've lost their minds and they've gone AWOL from grace, God hasn't left them. He'll, he'll never leave them. They've left grace, but grace, you may desert the Lord, but the Lord will never desert you. And the fastest way to desert the Lord is to go into legalism. You might say the fastest way is to go to a bar and get drunk. The fastest way is to go into legalism because it's blinding. You don't even know what you're doing. You get, you get so deep into it, you think you're doing great things for God. And it's so blinding, you get into so much arrogance, you've actually deserted the Lord and He'll punish you, but you won't even recognize it as punishment because you're so justifying everything you're doing. You will say, I'm being tested. Or you will say, the devil's after me. The devil's not after you. God is whipping you half to death. He's scourging you alive because you are AWOL from grace. And he wants to get you back to grace. So he skins you alive with the whip and then you blame it on Satan. It's very, legalism is a stench. Legalism is something people go into and it's very hard to get out of. And if you uh, come to this ministry or listen to Bible doctrine and get out of it, well, that's a wonderful thing. But as soon as you begin to neglect it or reject it or be offended, right back AWOL you'll go right back to the old ways, right back to the traditions. And that's exactly what the Galatians did. They went to tradition of Judaism. Now let's look at 1-7. Galatians 1-7. Not that there is another gospel. There's not. Not that there is another gospel. Gospel means the good news. It's good news you can believe in Christ, faith alone in Christ alone, and be saved. It's not such good news that you must be circumcised. So it's another gospel. And they say that, well, the, the true gospel is you, well, yeah, you believed in Christ, but now cut off your foreskin. I always wonder in Galatians, what about the women? Do you not even think about the women? No, they didn't. Women were second-class citizens. And that's not the way of Christianity either. We all have equal privilege and equal opportunity, man or woman. So what was the woman to do? Not be saved because she didn't circumcise herself? You see the, the idiocy of it all. But it's the same way today. People are idiotic. And you say, well, circumcision sounds kind of stupid. But people do all sorts of weird things today that are just as stupid. Don't do this, don't do that, don't do the other. Stop doing this. Stop doing that. Uh, some religions say you can't watch movies. Some religions say women can't wear pants and be saved. Women can't wear high heels and be saved. It's just as stupid. Just as stupid. And so they are trying to teach another gospel. Not that there is another gospel, except there are some. Who are these some? Legalists. There are some who are disturbing you and wanting to distort the gospel of Christ. Galatians 1.7 describes the United States of America today. 
and in the past. Galatians 1.7 describes the United States because the gospel has been disturbed and distorted. So again, not that there is another gospel, except there are some legalists who are disturbing you and wanting to distort the gospel of Christ. And boy, have they ever done that today. Now we've gone over this before, but we're going over it again because it's part of the subject of Galatians. And we need to get this down one more time as part of a foundation before we get deeper into Galatians. Now the Galatians started out faith alone in Christ alone. They believe that. And they're saved. Now they're adding works. And now they think it's salvation by works. And they used... Uh, all, they used behavioral works and all types of works, but we have many different works today that Satan has devised to disturb and distort the gospel of Christ, and Satan's done a good job at it. You can't hardly go to a church today and get the gospel straight. They'll be inviting Christ here and there and everywhere, or making him Lord, or doing this and that and the other, and they never come around to believing in Christ. I can't tell you how many funerals I've been to, and they never get to the gospel. They might, by chance, go over a verse that says, Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And they'll read the verse, Acts 16, 31a. They'll read it. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and you'll be saved. So right now, brothers, no call them brother, even though they're not saved yet. So right now, what you need to do is invite Christ into your heart. They just read the verse. And then they just go off on another tangent. And this is what happened to Galatia, and this is what's happened to America. And we need to note that just as the Apostle Paul is about to go nuts on these people, somebody needs to go nuts on America. Somebody needs to tell them it's faith alone in Christ alone. Somebody needs to tell them inviting Christ is nonsense. It's not there. So salvation by works is a false doctrine and it rejects the grace policy of God and it also rejects the depravity of man. Salvation by works is saying man is good enough to be saved, that the human race in some way has enough goodness to save itself. Salvation by works rejects the total helplessness of mankind. And the Galatians rejected their total helplessness. At first they knew they were helpless because Paul made it clear and they believed. Now the arrogant, legalistic people come by and say, oh no, you have got to do this and that. And now they get arrogant and they forget that they started out in real spiritual death. They forget that they are totally depraved and separated from God. So salvation by works also makes a distinction between Christianity and religion. In religion, it is salvation by works. You can't be saved that way, but religion says you can all religion has salvation by works. If you're Hindu, you got to work your way to nirvana. If you're Muslim, you got to work your way to have uh, 70 virgins. If you're Jew, you got to follow the law. And it's all works. You're doing something to be saved. And it's not possible. You can't save yourself. Jesus Christ did all the work. And to add to it is to say Jesus Christ did not do enough. It's arrogance. There are at least seven categories of salvation by works that are rejected by the Word of God. For Ephesians 2, 8, and 9 says, It is by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. We should all know this by now, but it's important to repeat because look at the Galatians. They had heard these things by Paul over and over and over again, yet once the legalists came around, they were sidetracked so fast, so quickly, it astonished Paul. And if you neglect the word or reject the word or hang out with legalists, you too will go in that same direction very, very quickly. You will be confused, very confused. And you will fall right into these things. Uh, you will fall into verbal works. Verbal works include repent and believe. See, we've noted repent, metanoieo, change your mind. And you know what it means now, or you should. Metanoia oh, means to change your mind about Christ. Doesn't mean to feel sorry about your sin. It means to change your mind about Christ. But if you reject doctrine or neglect doctrine and hang around legalists, you'll forget that. And it will be astonishing how quickly you'll forget it. So it's important to repeat these things. And Galatians will get tougher and tougher on legalism. Confession of sins to be saved. That's ridiculous. 
You confess your sins after you're saved. If you sin, name your sins to God. That's for rebound. But uh, people, uh, evangelists, will even say, name your sin to God and you'll be saved. Well, they're not even saved yet, and that won't save them. Only faith alone in Christ alone. That's a verbal work. Begging God to save you will not work either. That's a verbal work. Inviting Christ into your heart will not. Acknowledging Christ publicly will not save you. Acknowledging Christ publicly is a result. There's a means and there's a result. A result. You believe in Christ, then you may acknowledge him publicly. Because no one can call Jesus Christ Lord except from the Holy Spirit. So they've already believed. So uh, acknowledging Christ for salvation is not it. It's faith alone in Christ alone. Or they go through a magic word system or some type of superstition. Plead the blood, pray for strength, do this and that for salvation. Then we have ritual works. And this is something that the Galatians were into. They were into ritual works. Their ritual was circumcision. Circumcision was a favorite of the Jews and these Judaizers came to Galatia and Galatians had to be written to correct this. And boy, will the Apostle Paul ever correct this. And we'll get there later. The Galatians were a typical Gaelic people. The Galatians were the cousins of the Irish and the cousins of the Celtic people. And at first they were very excited and gung-ho about Paul's ministry. And as I said, the in terms of a stereotypical mindset, the Irish and the Celtic people are usually very hot-headed and they are very stubborn. So they're going to get into this legalism and they're going to get stubborn about it. So they started out hot for the word, now they're just going to get stubborn. And Paul is going to have to really beat them silly to knock it out of them. And he will, verbally, not physically. He will beat them silly verbally with sarcasm and all sorts of things. And believe me, I bet some of those Galatians got very hot-headed with Paul. It's the only way to deal with them, though, and Paul knows that. So salvation by baptism is another ritual work, as if baptism, dumping yourself in water, impresses God. Then there's psychological works. Psychological works. Oh, or is that ever in use today? Come forward. Come forward and be saved. Psychological. You can sit right where you are and be saved. You can be in a bar and be saved. You can be anywhere, airplane, wherever you want to be and be saved, just believe in Christ or raising your hand during a prayer. That's not salvation. Walking down an aisle, that doesn't save you. Giving a public testimony doesn't save you. These are simply psychological works. Then we have corporate works. Corporate works includes tithing. You're not saved unless you tithe or you're not spiritual unless you tithe. Now, the, of course, again, tithing was Mosaic Law, 10% income tax. We've noted that. Or you have to be in church-related works. You've got to work like a busy bee around the church to be saved. False. False doctrine. Some of the things that the Galatians believed, we believe today. Not us, but most people who even think they're saved and are not saved think they're saved because of these things. And it's satanic to the core. Satanic. Religious works. Religion is, of course, the devil's ace trump. And uh, Paul gave the Galatians faith alone in Christ alone and gave them the true gospel. And then Satan follows right up, right up behind Paul. As soon as Paul walks out, here comes Satan. Right on the tail. And why? So as to confuse the issue for the other Galatians who weren't saved yet. You see, uh, at first they might have been able to witness and say, well, Paul was here, uh, you can believe in Christ and be saved. And Satan says, ooh, there's too many Galatians believing, I'll follow up with this and I'll put a fly in the ointment and I'll confuse the issue. And boy, did he confuse the issue. So they thought they needed to keep the Mosaic Law. If you're Catholic, you think you need to do penance to be forgiven and even to be saved from purgatory, etc. Or they say you need to practice the Lordship of Christ. And that comes from the uh, silly epigram, if uh, Christ is not Lord of all, he's not Lord at all. That's blasphemous. God's all, or Jesus Christ has always been Lord. You can't make him Lord. And he is Lord of all. If he's not Lord of all, he's not Lord at all. But uh, they, th they think you must make Christ Lord. 
You can't make Christ Lord. He is Lord. You simply believe in him, making Christ Lord. Bunch of hogwash. How do you make Jesus Christ Lord? Do you see the arrogance behind it? Or you practice asceticism, and that means giving up all types of bad habits. There are habits that are bad, but are not sinful. It has nothing to do with spirituality. Or going through some type of self-denial, or going into a closet and praying there, or something else. And uh, people today even have gone so far, you're not saved unless you maintain a healthy body, etc. Or behavioral works. Behavioral works is salvation by morality, changing your lifestyle. Salvation by a personality change, going from mean to sweet. Most people who are saved go from sweet to mean because they suddenly fall under punishment. Or salvation by keeping taboos. They think you're saved if you uh, stop drinking. People even write books. Unbelievers write books and they tell about their life story. I was on drugs, but I quit. I used to be an alcoholic, but I don't drink anymore. I used to do this and that and the other and raise hell, and I don't do that anymore. And uh, Christians, so-called Christians, have read the book and say, this, book, this man's saved. And that man never even mentioned Jesus Christ. That man just made a behavioral change, a lifestyle change, probably one that is necessary or he would die. Probably a necessary lifestyle change, but it didn't save him. Or emotional work, salvation by feeling saved. And a lot of people say, well, I don't feel saved today, so I'm not saved today. Arrogance. Your feelings don't matter. It's what, it's what God thinks, and God thinks Christ died for you, and if you've believed it, it don't matter what you feel. Salvation by speaking in tongues, that's stupid and not legitimate. Salvation through feeling saved, salvation uh, through weeping tears in an altar, all of these things are nonsense. And faith has nothing to do with emotion. When you were in school and learned that one plus one was two, you believed it. You didn't cry over it. You believed it. And the teacher said one plus one is two. You didn't break down in tears and say, I believe it. I believe one plus one is two. <laughs> faith has nothing to do with emotion. Now, you might get emotional when you believe in Christ and there's nothing wrong with it because you might finally realize you've believed in Christ and you might finally realize you are saved from hell and you might get emotional. But it's not the means of your salvation. You could have a hangover and believe in Christ and feel terrible and still be saved. It has nothing to do with emotion. Romans 3, 20 through 28 summarizes this. Let's look at Romans 3, 20 through 28. And another, another uh, passage by the Apostle Paul. Romans 3, 20 through 28. Now Galatians is going to be good in a sense that it's going to go over some of the more basic things that we need to cement. Romans 3, 20 through 28. Therefore, by the works of the law, no human being shall be justified in his presence, for through the law is the knowledge of sin. But now apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been revealed, being confirmed by the Old Testament scriptures, the law of the prophets. That is the righteousness of God which comes through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no racial difference between Jew and Gentile. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, receiving justification without payment by means of grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus whom God the Father has publicly displayed by his blood at the mercy seat. Through faith, for a demonstration of his integrity, because of the passing over the previously committed sins, because of clemency from God, for the demonstration of his integrity at the present time of crisis, in order that he may be just, even when he justifies anyone who has faith in Christ. Where then is boasting? That's what the Galatians started doing boasting that they were doing something to be saved. Where then is boasting? It is excluded. By what principle? That of works? Definitely not. And Galatians started working for salvation. That's not the way. But by the principle of faith, 
Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. That's the Bible, folks. And nobody teaches it today. Very few people do. Now, I have heard on the radio a few people who are at least starting to get salvation right. They've been influenced by my pastor, no doubt. No doubt in my mind. Some of the vocabulary they use, only way they could get it is from my pastor. So that's encouraging every now and then when I hear they don't get the other stuff right, but at least they're getting salvation right because for a long time there's been no one who teaches faith alone and Christ alone. It started out in the 50s, mainly just my pastor, but there were others as well. But we've been in apostasy for so long, we need at least an evangelist or somebody to just get up and tell that it's faith alone and Christ alone, and that's it. And to just go by what the Bible says and not by emotion or what you think or feel. So this is what Paul is going to be talking about in Galatians. And not just this, but he's going to talk about spirituality by works and all of those things. And he's really going to get sarcastic. And that's when it's going to get fun, at least for me. I like it when he gets sarcastic. He's going to rip these people to shreds and they need it. We all need it in order that we do not go the way of the Galatians. Now they got straightened out, but we don't need to go that way. No reason for us to go that way. But if you neglect and reject the word, and if you hang around legalists, you will go there so fast, so quickly. You, it'll make your head spin. You'll be so far AWOL from grace and you may never come back. Galatians came back because Paul's going to shock them back. Obviously some of them will not come back, but a lot of them will. And we'll end with 1.8. But even if we or an angel from heaven ever preach a gospel contrary to the one we have already preached to you, Galatians 1.8, but even if we or an angel from heaven... Now why does he say even if we or an angel from heaven? Is the angel from heaven going to come down and give the gospel? No. The reason why he's saying if we or an angel from heaven is because when Paul first landed at Galatia, remember, they first thought he was a god. And then they surmised, well, maybe he's an angel. They thought Paul was an angel. So what he's telling them, if we or an angel from heaven, he's saying, look, what he's doing is he's reminding them of the respect they first had for him. And he's saying, you regarded me as an angel. So if this message comes from me or an angel, since you thought I was an angel, if it came from me or an angel, if a different one contrary, that's why it mentions angel. They thought he was an angel. They got straightened out on it. He just brings it up to show them they once had respect for him and his message. Now they don't. And now they're going to get mad at him. And they're going to get upset with him. So he has to throw it out there and say, hey, you once regarded me as an angel. But even if we or an angel from heaven ever preach a gospel contrary to the one we have already preached to you, keep on, linear action, Sark, keep on being accursed. Pastors who get up and they can't give the salvation message correctly and they add stuff to it are accursed. There are churches all around this nation accursed. Yeah, it has the name church, but they're accursed. Who wants to be at a place that's a curse? Some people do. They like to hang around with accursed people and have an accursed social life. Have fun in your accursedness. Accursed. Now, a Greek curse means to be set apart for divine destruction. Accursedness, it's a Greek word that means to be set apart for divine destruction. So if somebody is preaching to you a gospel, a gospel contrary to the one received... Keep on being a curse. That goes for believer and unbeliever. The believer who gives the gospel incorrectly and doesn't know what he's saying or just says it out of ignorance or says it out of arrogance that you must add works, anyone who does that is accursed. And set apart for destruction, set apart for sin face to face with death. They may live to be 70 or 80, but they will have the sin face to face with death and it will be awful. And then in their death, they will know. They will know if they have a prolonged death especially. They will know because they'll start thinking, was I good enough? 
See, they've always said I had to work my way into heaven. Now that they're dying, they're going to start thinking, was I good enough? And they're going to realize they weren't holy, they weren't perfect, and it's going to be torture for them, and they really might even get terrified. And they will be terrified going through their own death-shadowed valley. Why? They're accursed. And you don't want to hang around accursed people, and you don't want to become one who is accursed. There is something called, there's blessing by association, remember. There is something called cursing by association. Now you hang around people who are spewing out stuff that's not the gospel. You, you run around a church where they're not teaching correct doctrine. You'll be accursed right there with them. Now you might not believe that way, and you might just go for the social life, but you're hanging out with accursed people. It's that serious. And, and it was so serious that it really destroyed the Galatian church. started out wonderful. Now they're destroyed, just about. And Paul's making it clear, look, you are all accursed right now. They're going to straighten out, but right now they're accursed. And he's being tough on these half-Irish people. As we have said before, and keep on saying now again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to what you received, keep on being accursed. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege and opportunity of studying these things. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us to the things that we're going to note and to the importance of faith alone in Christ alone, to the importance of grace, and to the imp importance of avoiding legalism. For if we go in that direction, we will be accursed, along with the Galatians and all others who go in that way. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen.